Do you ever wonder if you're saved or what saved even means or what God is like or what Jesus did? Some people are embarrassed to ask these really basic questions, but please don't be. They're the most important questions you could ever ask. And that's why I want to give you a brand new copy of this little book I wrote called The Basics. Uh, You can get your paper copy or your digital copy or your audio copy or your video version just by going to timeofgrace.org slash the basics. How would you define temptation? I recently asked some kids that question and I got some interesting answers. One said, it's like reaching for another treat or another cookie and you know that mom and dad don't want you to have it. Another one said, it's wanting to pretend that I don't hear my mom and dad telling me to do something. Think about that. Wanting to pretend that I don't hear my mom and dad telling me to do something. That's pretty astute. Another one said, it's walking towards something when I know that it's a bad thing. Would you agree with those definitions? The age range was about seven to 17. And sometimes kids can say the craziest things, but I think you might agree with those definitions. They can say some pretty wise things. How would you define temptation? It's kind of hard to nail down because there's so much going on with temptation. I mean, for starters, you look out in the world and there is a lot around us that attracts us to do the wrong thing or to want the wrong thing. It's like a pathway here and a pathway there. It's trying to allure us. And there's so many things out there that we know, although they're attractive, they're not good for us. You think of a man who, he's a, he's a married man. He's a one woman man. But soon he starts to see other women and starts to think things that he shouldn't. That's an attraction in the world, a temptation in the world. Or, or somebody who wants power so they can manipulate something in their marriage or at work or with their kids or with their parents or with their circle of friends to get the right thing. That's an attraction, a temptation in the world. But it's not just the world or things in the world that attract us. There's a lot going on behind the scenes too. I'll describe maybe a second area. Think of it this way. The older we get, the more we recognize that the world has evil in it. I never met somebody who was in their 80s, 90s, or even over 100, and I, did a- I have asked many of them, what do you think about the condition of the world? They always say it's getting worse. So imagine if we lived to be 200 years old. Do you and I think that if we lived to be 200 years old, that at that point we would grow to learn that the world is becoming a better place? No. The older we get, the more and more exposed we are to more and more evil. In other words, that that evil is there. We just grow to learn, unfortunately, more and more about it. And if the older we get, the more and more we recognize evil, then how big is that evil? Yes, it's hard to talk about, but deep, dark evil, in fact, the source of evil himself, the devil, lurks around leading us trying to tempt us to do the wrong thing with the goal of ultimately trapping us and and getting us. And there's a third area too that's not easy to talk about, but it's true. It's ourselves. There's a part about us that we have to admit that wants the wrong things at times. I can prove it to you with a simple test. Have you ever had regret? Yep, that's all of us. And and what is regret except knowing that you pursued something and you shouldn't have, that it promised something good, but turned out to be quite bad. So between the world and deep, dark evil and ourselves, these forces serve as like an evil triumvirate working against us, providing pathways that seem attractive, but they're not. That, That is all comprising temptation. And that's not all. It attacks us in unique ways too. You see, we're not just insular beings. We, we have a, a body, we have a mind, we, we have a soul. And so our body is attracted with things, whether it's sexual or physical temptations or addictions. Our mind is attracted to things that aren't helpful, like anger and resentment, a, a, a grudge or bitterness, etc. And our soul even is tempted in certain ways. 
like when we have a deep longing that's hard to nail down physically or mentally. We are complex creatures, and that's why we need a strength that comes from outside of us to help inform us spiritually, mentally, and even physically. Jesus gives us a good place to turn to. When he was praying in that garden of Gethsemane before he died, before he was captured, he was telling his disciples something about temptation and also about who we are. He said, watch and pray, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. God promises and provides a, a spirit, a source of strength from none other than himself to encourage us and even inform us mentally and physically. According to our weakness, we're tempted in many ways, things that look attractive and aren't in our best interest. But God himself promises and provides a spirit that will help us in that time of need. Look no farther than the one who says those words. He doesn't just say, watch and pray. Don't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So buck up. That's not what he's saying. Look no farther than the one who actually overcame temptation in that very moment. Praying for strength and then overcoming temptation all the way to the cross to pay for every time we never have overcome temptation. Look no farther than the Savior who promises to be with us in those dark moments, those challenges. Every time there is a pathway that leads to the wrong thing. Yeah, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. But thankfully, we have a Savior who helps us, whether we are being tempted by the world, any sort of evil, or even ourselves. He is our strength when we are weak. He is probably one of the best litmus tests for how temptation works. He's the most famous king in the Old Testament. His name is David. And he did something that was awful for any king or any person to do. It was a time of year when soldiers would go off to war, but he stayed behind, even though he usually would go. And late one night, he was out on top of his flat roof and he was looking and he saw a woman bathing. And so he manipulated his kingly power to bring her to himself. And then he cheated on his wife with this woman. And this woman cheated on her husband with King David. If that wasn't bad enough, she conceived and was pregnant. And so David tried to cover it up. He brought her husband back from the battle lines in order to create this cover up. But this soldier was so noble that he could not imagine himself going home to his wife, having this relaxing time while his comrades were away at battle. So he refused to go to his house. He slept at the city gates. David tried twice, didn't work. So David sent a message back with this soldier so that this soldier would be killed on the front lines. And then David brought that woman to himself so that he could be the hero. He could take this poor widow in and she would be his wife. What an awful thing, a despicable thing. And although it started with one terrible night, it did not happen overnight. And that's an important thing to consider when we talk about temptation. Temptation is not just all of a sudden there's this switch that was flipped and whoop, we fell into sin, boom, that's it. No. Do you think that was the first time that David ever looked lustfully at a woman? That he ever had thoughts that led him down a darker and darker path mentally, sexually? Was that the first time he ever thought about how he could manipulate his power in order to get his way? No, there's a couple places in the Bible that actually talk about temptation and sin as though it is ironically a, a child that is growing inside the womb of his or her mother. That's like temptation. It grows and grows until ultimately it gives birth to sin. It's a picture to help us understand that temptation doesn't just happen overnight. It starts with thoughts that we shouldn't be thinking like stepping stones that are leading us down a path. And the path seems like it's totally fine and it's going to lead to greener pastures. But step after step, getting closer and closer, eventually it leads to sin, the separation from God, 
falling short of his expectations or, or crossing the line. All of those are, are pictures of what really creates brokenness and separation in our lives. And for David, did he think he got away with it? Well, God didn't think so. And so God sends his messenger, Nathan, to talk to and to even confront David. And Nathan tells this story. There was a man who was wealthy and had all these sheep, and there was a poor man who only had one sheep. And he took care of it as though it was a child of his. Well, one day the rich man stole that sheep and prepared it as a meal. And David hears this story and he's outraged and says, this man should die and pay for what he did. And then Nathan says, gotcha, David, you are this man in this story. To go well for us, temptation tells us that every stepping stone along the way is for our good until we realize that, well, that it's not. And so David found that out. Like I said, he serves as the litmus test and demonstrating where temptation ultimately wants to lead. It leads to destruction, to brokenness, damage. In his case, it led to adultery and even murder. And yet, David is the perfect litmus test, not just because he failed, but also because of how he responded. In this moment, when Nathan confronted him, what did David do? Did he deny it? Did he kick him out because he's the king after all? Did he refuse to listen? Did he act belligerently? No, this is exactly the way that David responded. I have sinned against the Lord. Nothing else. How valuable for us that when we are tempted and when we fall into sin, the thing that we're afraid of doing is admitting it, acknowledging it, fessing up. We think that that's the worst thing you could do. It's maybe better to hide it, to cover it. We might be worried that God might, might get us. And, and even if we're talking to other people, if we confess our sins to them, somebody that we trust, of course, that they might burn us. But no, this is the message that God has for us. The message that he had through his messenger, Nathan. The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. The Lord does not like that we are tempted or that we fall into sin. But through confessing our sin, he demonstrates his ultimate goal. To communicate forgiveness. That that sin is taken away. That ultimately, although we may die in this life and will unless Jesus comes first, we will not die forever. Instead, God has provided eternity for us. And so when we face temptation, we keep our eyes fixed on the one who pays for all of those sins. And that in and of itself strengthens us in our time of need. So we can pray like King David did. After confessing his sin, owning up to it, he went on to pray these words. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Since the Lord has taken away our sin for all eternity, will he not also strengthen us and restore in us that joy right now, even strengthening our spirit to help us when we are weak and even tempted? Does your boss really understand you? There's a popular show that you may have seen where the boss goes undercover, puts on a lot of makeup, maybe even a fake mustache, and leaves the corporate office and goes down to work with the grunts, the, the bottom level, the people that are doing the everyday tasks, the, the peons as it were. And in so doing, the, the employees get to learn something throughout this process from their employer. But every time without fail, is it not fascinating what the employer learns about the employees, their lives, their struggles, the things that they have to deal with, not only in the workplace, but also at home. That's what makes that show and those scenarios so attractive. To see someone who's way up there kind of come to grips with and finally get what's going on down there. So does your boss get you? The only way you could say no is if you are the boss and maybe you're in the corporate office, but you at least know what that question means. 
when the, they're moving pieces around in the corporate puzzle when they're maybe way off in some condo looking at spreadsheets? Do, do they really understand what's going on in, in the restaurant, in the kitchen, at the construction site, in the office, day after day, working with customers? Do, do they understand you? We tend to think that way, and for good reason, especially when it comes to temptation. We think that way about God. Is, is it possible for God, who's in that great CEO office called heaven, to understand what we are dealing with when our body, our mind, and our souls are being pulled down these pathways that are attractive, that allure us, that, that, that pull us, and we know they're not for our good? Does he get that at all? Well, when you think about Jesus, we have to say, yes, he does understand. In fact, in this New Testament letter called the letter to the Hebrews in chapter four, it says this, Jesus is, is not like some high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but instead he has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Tempted in every way. That can be hard to understand when you think about Jesus, right? Because when you see Jesus performing miracles, it looks like this superhuman hero walking around doing things that, well, only superheroes can do. And so they don't understand what it's like for the rest of us. When he's calming the sea and when he's feeding thousands, right away they wanted to make him a, a king. After all, he can feed them with a drop of a hat. Was he tempted in that moment to take a place of political power or prominence? to lead people that would give him popularity? Or even consider when Jesus was on trial and there's Pontius Pilate asking him all of these questions and peppering him. Was he tempted to walk away? Jesus was tempted in every single way. You see, the truth about Jesus is he is fully God, 100%. But far beyond our, what our brains can comprehend, he is also at the same time fully human. And therefore, just as the Bible says, he has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Now, as I imagine what that might look like, I think of scenarios like this that I think are reasonable. There are some women that are very attracted to men who are in positions of power, prominence, and have a lot of popularity. When thousands of people are following Jesus, is it out of the question to imagine that maybe there was a woman or two or more that made a pass at Jesus in the wrong way? When Jesus was a little kid, did he ever experience what it's like to reach for that extra treat, even though he knew that he shouldn't, whether literally or proverbially? Does he know what it's like to experience temptation? Whatever that may look like, it's really hard for us to understand and maybe we should just leave it there. But what we can say is he was tempted in every way, just as we are. And that's a beautiful truth for us when we're stuck in our weaknesses and we're wondering if God gets us at all. Yes, he does. There's never a time when you're being attracted to the wrong thing, when you're being led down the wrong path, when you're being tempted, where you can look at your savior and think, he doesn't understand. No, no, he does in every single way. So he can identify with what you're facing. But there's another beautiful truth that comes right at the end of that verse I just shared. He's tempted in every way. So he does understand, he does get you. You're not alone in this. But here's the major truth yet he was without sin. Although tempted in every way, he never sinned so that his perfect life would cover over my imperfection, so that his perfect obedience to God would cover over every time you and I have been disobedient. And since he was perfect in every way, although he experienced every temptation, that life becomes our life. In fact, it was his life that ultimately led to the cross to pay for our guilt and erase our shame. So is he not going to be with us when we are tempted in any way? In that same letter to the Hebrews, just two chapters earlier, chapter two, verse 18, he's talking about how Jesus, since he was tempted and experienced weakness, one great 
application now is that he is going to help us no matter what we face. This is what it says. Because Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So no matter what it is, you think it's too gross, too awful, too painful, too hard, too challenging. Jesus not only overcame every one of those temptations, he did that to prove that he is with you no matter the path, no matter the struggle. When I was a kid, there was one thing that made me dislike, unfairly, the state of Iowa. Now, no offense to any of our friends from the state of Iowa, I'll explain. It wasn't because it was flat and I grew up around mountains. I think there's something beautiful about some flat corn land and prairie land. It wasn't that. Remember, this was when I was a kid. We only drove through a corner of it once, I think, on a family vacation. But you know what it was? It was the Iowa Basic Skills Test. You might also think of other Scantron tests like the ACT or the SATs. These big long tests where you're column after column, row after row, you have to fill in that little oval and do it all the way, question after question. I kind of liked those days when we had to take those long tests because we had longer recess. But aside from that, those tests seemed like they wouldn't end. And sometimes they were quite hard. But when you think of tests, especially uncomfortable ones in life, that's one of the ways that the Bible describes temptation. Temptation is not just this slippery slope. It actually is a time, a, a testing, so that we can persevere and demonstrate strength outside of us in those moments of trial. You think of some of the tests that you've endured in life, and not just a Scantron test, but real legitimate tests. Like maybe your marriage was tested. It tested your patience, tested your ability to remain calm, it tested your faithfulness, but you were able to hopefully find strength in those moments of trial, and through that testing, you became stronger because of it. You think even as a kid, how many times do we say as adults, or even as kids, we wish we knew however many years ago what we know now? It doesn't matter how old you are, we wish that we knew back then the things that we know now, because now having that wisdom, we wish we could go back and do things differently when we maybe failed in life's tests. But now that we can see it with hindsight, doesn't that give us a type of strength? We call it wisdom and experience. See, tests and temptations are not these things that God puts out as traps, just waiting to see if we're gonna land on the next landmine and blow up and he's entertained by it. No, that's not what this is at all. I understand the question that commonly arises when it comes to temptations. God is in control, so therefore, why does he allow us to even be tempted? It's important for us to remember that he did not break this world. Humankind broke this world. But God still, in his wisdom, allows us to experience tests, not because he is vindictive, not because he doesn't care, but actually to allow us to trust in him and to find strength that we otherwise wouldn't have. In addition, he also allows us to experience tests and temptations in life so that we would long for eternity where those things don't exist anymore. This is a very challenging thing, especially when you and I think of those most difficult tests in life. I was talking to a lady who just recently was diagnosed with cancer. There's been actually several ladies that I know who've been diagnosed with cancer over the years. Maybe you know of some ladies or men too who are struggling with that. But when diagnosed with cancer, one of the things now having come out of it, she says, I still wouldn't trade that struggle for anything because I know more about myself and my God than I ever could have before. Of course, you wouldn't wish that upon anyone that challenged that battle with cancer. But the reality that she now has, the perseverance, that strength, God was working through that trial, through that struggle to give her that strength. Does he not promise to do the same for us when we are tempted in any way? In the New Testament book of James, he puts it this way. 
Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now there's a lot there, but I purposely read all of it because it's so wonderful. God is not tempting. Instead, through trial, he allows us to experience those moments of temptation so that we trust in him, so that we find strength from him to overcome those tests. And it makes us stronger because of it. And every good and perfect gift comes from God, including the gift of the crown of life, where there is no testing or struggle. Yes, that means that in the here and now, we will face temptations. And maybe this is something that you may not have heard or may not have heard often. Temptations don't go away. For your entire life, you will face trials. It is never going to be easy. There's never a time when you stand on the victor's panel with your hands in the air holding the trophy because you conquered every one of the weaknesses of this world in yourself. But the reason that is true is so that we would never look to ourselves to find blessing and strength. Instead, we would look to God who never changes like shifting shadows. Instead, he promises to bless us, to help us in our time of need, to strengthen us through whatever trials we face. And even when we fall flat on our face, who is the one who is there to pick us up? Still bearing the wounds of the cross, full of forgiveness and grace, he brings us close to himself until he welcomes us for all eternity. So when you are being tempted, when you are being tested, when you face trials that are great and even small, it is God who gives you the blessings through his word. It is God who has already prepared a place for you with him in glory. How much heat can your hands take? I remember as a kid, going to help my mom wash the dishes. And I put my hands in that hot soapy water and I pulled them out thinking that my skin was going to be gone because it was so hot. And I remember asking her, how can you wash dishes with water that is so hot? And she said, well, if you helped wash dishes more, you would get more used to it. <laughs> she got me. I have a friend who was a cook at one time. And in order to find out whether or not these big thick hamburger patties were cooked just to the right temperature, he didn't use tongs or spatula. He would use his fingers to, to pick them up and squeeze them. And he even used his fingers to flip them over on the hot burner that was cooking them. I asked him, how can you do that? He said his fingers developed such calluses and his nerves just got used to it. And over time, he could deal with that heat. You know, when we think about temptation, in a lot of ways, it's dealing with the heat around us. And it can feel like we'll, we really can't stand a chance. There has to be a way that we can overcome and deal with the heat of everything that's tempting us, whether it's our own desires or it's things that are attractive in this world or the pressures of evil around us that seem hot and hotter still day after day. But that's why God gives us a special protection. And it's not just some type of callousness for our hands or nerves that just get used to it over time. No, it's something that is entirely outside of us. There's this beautiful picture, you think about armor. After describing to believers that we have everything we could ever need in Jesus Christ, it's like this beautiful eternal sphere in which we live, a reality in which we now stand by God's grace, having communicated that throughout this letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is then inspired to share these words about the armor that God gives us to help us when we're facing heat on every side, temptations. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Notice this isn't something that we must muster up on our own. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That, that's really where strength is found. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. If the devil's been around a long time, he's met more than a hundred people that are like us that have our weaknesses. In fact, many more. So does he not know how to scheme in order to try and get at us, get at us in order to lead us down the wrong path? Maybe we should give him a little bit more credit with all humility. And then that is why we need the armor that only God can give us. Not this armor that has gaps between plates, no chinks here or there. Rather, we need the full armor of God. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In the first video in this series, I mentioned that we're attacked on three sides, ourselves, the world, and the deep, dark evil that is out there. But the Bible makes it clear that is the case. But since our battle is really against an evil that we can hardly comprehend, all the more reason then that we need a God who is greater than that evil, and we have one. A God who equips us with armor that is full and complete, and it helps us withstand every scheme that this dark evil tries to employ against us. Every time there is a path, let's say it's lust for somebody who is not your spouse, or lust for the wrong thing, a discontentment in our heart because we're not okay with the blessings that God has given us, the temptation to manipulate the things in our life, whether we want to get an advantage at work, in the economy, over against people that are below us or weaker than us, in our marriage and relationships, our friendships with our kids, even the temptation to simply grab onto some type of treat that this world offers that we know is definitely not going to be enough for us in the end. Whatever it might be, there are so many stepping stones that the darkness of evil tries to put out before us to allure us. A type of scheming that is way too strong for us. But that is why we have and that is why we need the armor of God. Look at how he describes it. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. In every way that the, we are trying to be deceived in this world, with all of the lies that are bombarding our hearts and our minds, we have God's truth, symbolic belt that keeps us tight and fastened, helping unveil the deceiver and everything that he is telling us. with the breastplate of righteousness in place. This perfect symmetry with everything that God demands to being able to stand before God and say, I never took a wrong stand. That can't come from us. It can only come from the one who withstood every temptation, Jesus, the righteous one. And he gives his righteousness to us, his people, so that it covers over us as we stand before God, but it also protects us when we stand against the assaults of the evil one. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Feet that are ready to, to stand firm because we know where we stand. We stand in God's grace and that gives us peace. But we are also ready to move, to be able to share this gospel of peace in a world that is dying, broken, hurting, and falling into so many temptations. How many people don't even know? But we have this good news that brings peace to a dying world. Which is really important when you think about temptation, isn't it? That God who loves us doesn't just give us equipment just for ourselves, but this proper equipment to help other people that are struggling to stand under the heat of temptation as well. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one arrows that are meant to cut, hurt, and even kill. But they're flaming. They're intended to burn. All of these temptations lead to that. But we have this shield of faith that God has given us that extinguishes these flaming arrows, and it helps us 
yes, but it also helps us help others. Finally, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This helmet of salvation it protects us. That we are already God's children, having been saved by everything Jesus has done. But we're not just supposed to be lying around like some sheep. We have the sword of the Spirit. We have the Word of God that identifies all of the lies that the devil and this world and even we tell ourselves. This sword is living and active. It is powerful. It redeems people and connects those that are lost to the God who only wants them to be found. And it even helps us when we are being tempted so that no matter what stepping stones are in front of us, we have all of the equipment we need and we have all of the equipment that others around us also need. It is this word of God that is powerful, that has saved us and connected us to our Savior now and forever.